Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about children's pythons and if they actually are a good beginner snake. Probably one of the main misconceptions about children's pythons for new snake keepers or for someone who's buying their child a first pet snake is the name children's python because it seems to imply that they're suitable for children. In actual fact, these snakes are just named after the person who discovered them, whose name is George John Children, hence the name Children's Python. But that aside, we're going to just talk a little bit about these snakes and determine whether or not you would like to start off with one of these, or potentially get your child their first pet Children's Python, and whether or not it is actually suitable for what you want. So I will say that with any type of snake, they've all got teeth, they can all bite. Some are just more statistically prone to being defensive than others. And children's pythons are no exception to the rule there. So I found the best way to start off with a children's python, if you want to get one for your child or for yourself as your first time snake and you don't want to have something that bites, get a hatchling and handle it regularly. Hatchling children's pythons are usually pretty placid most of the time. There's always a few that behave differently, but majority are pretty placid from the start and if you handle it regularly, it'll remain that way as it gets older. Where when you look at like carpet pythons, they're kind of the opposite. Statistically, most young carpet pythons are very snappy and you have to handle them regularly to get them out of the snappy phase so when they're bigger, they don't bite your face off every time you try and hold them. Now this is my young female, the one that was in my recent video where it, um, I built an incubator because she laid some eggs a few weeks ago. I'll pop a link at the top of the screen if you wanna watch that one but she's probably my calmest children's python. She's been handled the most regular, so she's pretty okay with being handled. Saying that, over the years of snake keeping, I've kept quite a lot of children's pythons at different time frames in their lifespan, coming from different places as well. Some I've had from hatchlings myself, and they've been most of the time pretty good. But I've found whenever I get a children's python that is from somewhere else, and it's already an adult, and it's, and I'm basically taking it because I'm rehoming it. Most of the time their personality is not great. For all those of you who watch my videos and aren't aware, at least half of my snakes are rehomes. They're snakes that were um, passed on to me or I kind of just took pity on and took because the person, because the people who currently had them just couldn't look after them or didn't want them anymore. Most of the time, because they didn't have a great personality and they were snappy snakes, so I just took them off their hands because I couldn't deal with having a snake that bite, that would bite them all the time. This one, my little female, she was a rehome. Um, I don't know what her history is, to be honest, but thankfully she must have been handled enough because she's pretty calm for the most part. Saying all that, this is a male children's. It was also one that I took off someone else's hands because they no longer wanted to keep him. Um, and his personality isn't as calm as a female. I would not hand this snake off for someone else to handle unless they knew how to handle snakes and were okay with being bitten. He does get a bit defensive sometimes and he will strike when he's like that. He's not too bad now because he's kind of cool and sluggish at the moment. He did have, he did have a few pop shots at me when I went to get him out of the tank. Usually once I get him out he seems to calm down a little bit um, saying that, he's still very easily startled and kind of, yeah, provoked into a strike sometimes. You notice when I'm holding him, I do try to keep him at arm's length from my face because, um, like I said, he is a little defensive sometimes. And one thing I've noticed with children's pythons in comparison to carpet pythons, they're not as predictable and they're a little harder to read with their body language. I can still read them, but I have to be a little bit more on the ball with these guys because, yeah, carpets will give you a warning before they strike. They'll give you plenty of notice. They'll tense up, they'll S up their neck, they'll be hissing. They'll look at what they're about to strike and zone in on it first. Children's pythons can be sitting perfectly still and motionless and they can strike forwards, they can strike sideways, they can strike backwards, where carpets can't really do that. So he's climbing up my arm towards my face now which is why I've got a hold of his body so he can't go any further up because I just don't trust him. <laughs> but so far so good, he's actually behaving quite well. Like I said, he usually has a bit of a defensive behavior when I first go to get him out, but once he's out, he's not too bad. This is another female of mine. As you can see, she's even larger than my other two. 
Uh, she's my most recent one that again was a rehome, and her personality is worse than the other two combined. She is defensive and she has an extremely strong feeding response to the point where she just constricts your hand when you're holding her. Which is why I'm using a hook, because honestly, I don't fancy being bitten today. So, yeah, it's not often you find children's pythons quite like this one. This one is a bit abnormal. Uh, every time I have my hands on her without a snake hook, she'll feel the warmth of my hands and just start constricting, and then she'll grab onto your hand and start trying to eat it. This is the sort of behavior I would expect out of a Woma python, to be honest, not a children's. So a little bit abnormal on that one. Um, but again, never handled as a baby, I suppose, which is probably why she's like this. Possibly only interacted with by her owners when she was fed and nothing else, which is why she associates any contact with people as food. So this here is about maximum size for a children's python. She's about four foot. She doesn't look it in the video, but yeah, she's about four foot long. Females tend to get a bit bigger than males. So if you've got a female, she'll average on about four foot where males are more around three. So I'm gonna just try and hold without the hook for a bit. She seems to be a little bit better at the moment. So hopefully she behaves. I'm not honestly worried about the defensive strikes, it's the feeding response that she has where she'll just randomly coil around your hand and want to eat it. But I think at the moment her mind isn't really on food because I've had her out for a bit and she's a little distracted. So like I said, if you want to get a children's python and you want it to be a good handling type of snake, uh, get a young one, handle it regularly when it's little. Or if you did want to get an adult, at least know where it's coming from. She nearly got me. She was doing that thing where they kind of rub their mouth against your hand, thinking about biting it. Yeah, so if you want an adult, at least know where it's coming from, know the person you're getting it off, um, and they can tell you whether or not it is actually handleable or not, otherwise get a young one. So once you've got your young children's python, you want to start it off in a small enclosure. When their hatchlings are only about 20 to 25 centimeters long, they're very small. You can keep it in basically a shoebox sized hatchling tank for like the first year or so. Once it gets into its more sub-adult size, like you want to upgrade the tank slowly as it grows. But you know, once it's around this sort of young adult size, you can move it into its uh, full sized enclosure that'll do it for the rest of its life. So for a single adult children's python, something that's about three foot, by 45 centimeters or three foot by two foot even would be perfectly fine. You want to allocate for a little bit of height as well. They're, they're not a true arboreal snake, but they're not a true terrestrial snake either. They probably spend about 70% of their time on the ground, but they do climb. So you can't hurt to have a little bit of height. Give them some branches to climb on. You want to provide them with also a couple of hides in the enclosure, one on the warm side, one on the cool side. As for heating these, you can either go with a ceramic heat emitter or a heat lamp or a heat mat. It's honestly up to you. They don't require UVB lighting, as most pythons don't, with the exception of diamond pythons. These guys don't need UV light, so you don't have to worry about that. Feeding these isn't nowhere near as um, costly as a carpet python because the size of the food they're gonna be eating is significantly smaller. My big coastal carpet, he eats a jumbo sized rat every two to four weeks, depending on the weather, because when it's warmer, he eats a bit more regular. Children's pythons of adult size like this, or like that big female I had out before, they'll be eating an adult mouse, and that's it. They don't need anything bigger than that. During spring and summer, during the warmer times of the year, you can feed them once a week, so once every two weeks. When it gets cooler and gets into your more winter seasons, you can drop it down to once every two to three weeks if you want to. Sometimes you will find if it gets a bit cold, they will go into like a bit of a hibernation sort of state where they just go off their food and they don't really come out and do much. Nothing really to worry about, it's perfectly normal. I found that um, my male seems to do it, but my female doesn't, so it kind of just is an individual sort of thing to a point as well. I still offer her food, but most of the time during winter she won't take it. But fortunately, if you have as many snakes as me, there's always something else that will take it if she doesn't want it. As for bedding for these, you can go with cocoa fiber, you can go with repti bark, you can go with fine desert sand. It's all fine. Where these guys come from in Central Australia, the fine desert sand is basically in the environment they live in. So it's not a problem for them. But like I said, if you don't want to use sand, because if you have a tank with sliding doors, sand gets in the runners and it scratches up your doors and it just sounds horrible when you're trying to open your doors. If you want to avoid that, then 
just dried coconut fibre will be fine, or repti bark, or critter comfort, whatever you prefer. Aspen bedding is also fine. Provide them with a water bowl big enough they can fully soak in and submerge themselves, as sometimes they do like to soak when they're about to shed their skin. And regarding their warm spot, I'd get a digital thermometer of some sort and have your hot spot, whatever's heating it, whether it be a ceramic heat emitter or a heat mat, have it hooked up to a thermostat, set the thermostat to 30 degrees Celsius, and you're good to go. As a general thing, this isn't really specific to just children's pythons, just for honestly reptiles in general that need some sort of heating. I personally like to use these um, laser pointers. It's a laser pointer thermometer. I think doctors use these to test your temperature and stuff, but you can use them for virtually anything. You just point the laser at the hot spot and it'll give you a digital reading of the temperature and they're quite accurate. Uh, just make sure you don't point it through the glass at the hot spot because that won't be accurate. You've got to open the doors of the tank and then use it. Because it is handy to always double check that your, your thermostat is set properly or it's not malfunctioning by actually testing the temperature yourself too. One other thing I'll just clear up about these guys' behaviour, I know we kind of already covered their behaviour and I did talk on about it a little bit longer than I probably wanted to, but one other little thing I'll just mention as a general rule, if you get a children's python or you don't, um, just if you want a snake in general and it's your first time, snakes aren't tame, they don't like being handled, they don't enjoy it, they simply tolerate it to a point and some species are just more tolerant than others and some individuals are able to become more tolerant than others through the way you bring them up. So just kind of bear that in mind every time you're actually taking a snake out and handling it. It's purely for your enjoyment, not theirs. So keep handling to a minimum. Otherwise, you know, prolonged handling can stress some snakes out and cause other problems for them. Like if they're really stressed from too much handling, they might go off their food or they might develop other abnormal behavioral problems. It's hard to say, but yeah, just keep that in mind. Handling snakes is for our pleasure, not theirs. So to summarize, if you want a very small python that maxes out at about three and four foot long, doesn't need an overly large enclosure, only needs to be fed every couple of weeks, a relatively small food item as far as most snakes go, Maybe a children's python is what you want. Alrighty guys, well that's pretty much my video on children's pythons. Before I go, if you've enjoyed this video, leave a like. Don't forget to smash that notification bell so you guys know when I put new videos up. Instagram's down below if you want to check that out as well. But until then, I'll see you all in my next video. Bye bye.